Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are three people who have spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's the honor of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th century love story, and the man whose nickname is Rosebud, Chris Haley. I also like to hold uh, little snow globes as I walk around screaming it, too. Okay. Also with us is the woman who was actually Charles Foster Kane's third wife, except she was a she was a drama critic hired by his paper to review his second wife's opera performances. Lori Flores. Wow, that made my head hurt. I know, didn't it? It had made my head hurt just to try to squeeze it out. <laughs> That's what she said. Finally, the youngest member of our group and the man who's the illegitimate son of Agnes Moorhead, Matt Palmer. You guys don't even want to know what I nicknamed Rosebud. <laughs> all right. Welcome, everyone. And this week we're reviewing Matt's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time, 1941's Citizen Kane. And you're probably wondering, we got into the like. 50s and episodes and you're finally reviewing Citizen Kane, shut up. It's going to take us a long time to do Gone with the Wind too, but we'll get there at some point. But Matt, do you have a summary for us? Can you tell me a story? All right, here it is. As Charles Foster Kane dies, he speaks his last word, Rosebud, as a snow globe slips from his hand and shatters on the floor. Next, we see a newsreel of Kane's life from the public view. He is portrayed as an incredibly wealthy publisher with a penchant for seeking... Well, that's a lot of peas. I don't even... <laughs> I didn't realize I was writing this. Uh, we know your affinity for alliteration. So. <laughs> Might have to edit out a few of these P's. He's portrayed as an incredibly wealthy publisher with a penchant for seeking <laughs> personal publicity. <laughs> uh, uh, let me let me change this a little bit. <laughs> no, I liked it. <laughs> He's portrayed. It, it. <laughs> it's perky. <laughs> yeah, but, and but, pleasurable. He's, it's perfectly on point. <laughs> and pertinent. Uh, he's portrayed as an incredibly wealthy publisher with a penchant for seeking attention and a desire to hold public office that was undone by an extramarital affair with a woman that would become his second wife. As the reel concludes, a reporter, Jerry Thompson, is taking um, – sorry. As the reel concludes, a reporter, Jerry Thompson, is tasked with discovering the real Charles Kane – particularly by finding the meaning of Rosebud. Thompson, inter inter Thompson interviews those close to Kane. Initially, Kane's second wife, Susan Alexander Kane, refuses to talk to him. Thompson is granted access to the memoirs of Walter Parks Thatcher, Kane's late guardian. Thatcher was retained to be Kane's guardian by Kane's mother when he was just a child. Kane's mother inherited an abandoned gold mine that turned out to hold enormous wealth. After that wealth was discovered, Kane's mom hired Thatcher to take him away from his father to be raised by a bank with Thatcher as trustee. Kane left devastated with Thatcher, clutching his toy sled. Thatcher writes that Kane became something of a playboy, was expelled from various boarding schools and colleges, and ultimately, and ultimately decided he wanted to run a newspaper that the trustees bought in a bankruptcy sale. Kane takes charge of the paper as his pet project sinking $1 million a year into the paper to keep it afloat. Initially, Kane sets out to protect the little man and publishes articles attacking Thatcher's business interests. Kane puts a declaration of his principles on the front page that he will be honest and protect the interests of the working man. However, when the Great Depression sets in, Kane is forced to sell a controlling interest in his now expansive media empire to Thatcher. Thompson interviews Kane's personal business manager next, Mr. Bernstein. Bernstein remembers Kane fondly as a playboy and a businessman. 
he recalls how Kane was driving to be the most widely circulated, most influential newsman in New York. Kane hired away all the best journalists from his primary competitor and used his influence to sell the public on the Spanish-American War, further bolstering his fame and influence. Kane marries to the niece of the president of the U.S., Emily Norton. Next, Thompson interviews Kane's estranged best friend, Jedediah Leland. Jedediah tells of how Kane's marriage to Emily fell apart due to his affair with Susan. Kane was running for governor of New York and was certain to win. The incumbent, however, lures Emily to Susan's love nest where he offers to keep the affair a secret if Kane will drop out of the race. Kane refuses, accusing the governor of trying to steal the love of the people away from him. Kane loses Emily, the election, and Jedediah. Jedediah asks to be transferred to the Chicago News Division, and Kane reluctantly lets him go. Kane marries Susan, who desires to be a famous singer. The newspapers, however, refer to Susan as a singer in quotation marks. Perceiving this as a slight, Kane builds an opera house in Chicago where Susan is the debut singer. Susan is terrible. Kane has his papers write glowing reviews of her performance. Jedediah, however, refuses and begins to write an honest review before passing out drunk on his typewriter. Kane finds Jedediah, finishes the panning review for him, and fires him. They never speak again. Susan later agrees to be interviewed by Thompson. She's broke and running a nightclub. She tells Thompson how Kane forced her to continue performing opera, even as every non-Kane paper lambasts her performances. Later, Kane builds Xanadu for her, a giant unfinished palace in Florida. Susan is lonely and unhappy at Xanadu, but Kane is deaf to her concerns. Finally, Susan leaves Kane, and he dies alone at Xanadu. The team of reporters reaches its dead end at Xanadu and abandons their project after nobody knows what Rosebud means. But as some of the many possessions Kane hoarded over the years are stuffed into a furnace for incineration, Kane's childhood toy sled lands on the flames where the inscription Rosebud bubbles away until nothing is left. Yay! All right, films are impacted by the times that they're made in, and we look back at some of the headlines of those times in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Nineteen forty one was a year that will live in infamy. The United States joined World War II after the Japanese attacked their Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill launched his V for Victory campaign. The United States Congress passed the Lend Lease Act, enabling the President to sell, lend, and lease war supplies to other countries. Greta Garbo retired at age 36. Nobel Prizes were not awarded in 1941 because nothing was considered worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Popular artists on the radio were Glenn Miller and his orchestra, Artie Shaw and his orchestra, Jimmy Dorsey and his orchestra, and Sammy Kay and his orchestra. Wow, and his orchestra got around a lot those days, didn't they? <laughs> they did. Americans gathered around their radios to listen to President Roosevelt's fireside chats, the Academy Awards, and I think Rebecca won for Best Picture that year. Is that right? During 1941 or for the films that came out in 1941? In, for, during 1941. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Rebecca. For, for, so that would have been for 1940. Yeah. Um, the Inner Sanctum Mystery, The Avenger, Claudia and David and Duffy's Tavern. That one sounds good. <laughs> Movies at the box office included The Maltese Falcon, Dumbo, High Sierra, How Green Was My Valley, and Hitchcock's Suspicion. Also, this week's reviewed film, Citizen Kane, was released and performed dismally at the box office. And that's a look at 1941. All right, we usually begin with talking about the casting of the film. And in this film, the central character, although always told in flashback, essentially is Charles Foster Kane, played by Orson Welles, who's essentially making his theatrical debut, uh, writer, director, I believe producer, and a star of Citizen Kane. 
Uh, what did you guys think of Orson Welles in the lead role in this film? And we'll start with Matt since it's his pick. Oh, I, I absolutely love him. And that he had his hand in so many different aspects of this of this movie at that age is is really remarkable. It makes me feel really old. <laughs> you didn't accomplish as much at, by 25 as he has? Well, I'm, I'm 33 now, and I still haven't really accomplished anything. So, yeah. You have a beautiful family. Eh, a lot of people have one of those. <laughs> Keeping Kane up. didn't have it, so you got <laughs> that, that on him. That's true. Laurie? <laughs> he was brilliant. Um, I, I almost think, it, we've talked about this before, it's almost kind of sad when someone peaks so young. And not just peaks, but creates this incredible masterpiece. Um, but But what people don't know is he was greatest as a prompter. You mean on the radio? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. I just okay. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't know if he, he just did everything. No, he he. I mean, without a doubt, Citizen Kane is his seminal work. But to say he peaked, I mean, he still had the Third Man in front of him, Touch of Evil in front of him, and who could forget the ultra classic Transformers the movie? Um, <laughs> That's the, how he ended his life. He was in Transformers, the movie? The animated one it. from the 1980s? Yes, he did the voice of, I believe, Unicron in it. That It was so bad that they had to uh, basically electronify, electronic, whatever you want to say. Uh, amplify? A, amplify his and make his voice sound electronic. He's completely unrecognizable. But it is Orson Welles, Citizen Kane himself, doing the voice of Unicron in that film. You and he was as his... large as Unicron at that point. <laughs> That's too. true. Unicron was an, in, an entire planet. So, you left out his brief stint into uh, James Bond film. Oh, that, how could we forget that? I, I still stings in my memory that I've spent even more time watching 1967's Casino Royale. And who who could also forget one of the films from my childhood on the childhood loop, uh, The Man Who Saw Tomorrow, about Nostradamus, that documentary that he narrated that. That is my first exposure to Orson Welles, besides the wine commercials, of course. But th that is, uh, you know, Orson Welles. I didn't know that was the same man when I, by the time I saw Citizen Kane, because I've, I've always saw him as this literally larger-than-life character. He Did he bad. always have a love for magic? Because I noticed there was a, one brief uh, magic reference in this film as well. And it seems a lot of his films have some sort of magic reference. He was an amateur ma magician, so that's probably why he incorporated that into uh, a lot of the roles he played, such as the dismal 1967's Casino Royale. But we need not digress. There's a podcast entirely talking about that. Uh, Chris, what do you think of Orson Welles now that I've ranted? What I liked about it was... Uh, you compare this to uh, Jimmy Stewart in um, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, where he was old and trying to look like a young guy, and it just didn't work, whereas this worked much better as Orson Welles, the young guy, being aged. And I thought when by the time you got to him being the old man before his death, I, I, I think the makeup did look a little bit hokey, but I thought – he looked much. He he still looked as like a valid older guy th through much of it. I, I thought when he was destroying the room a little, it looked like he was trying to hold his his bald wig on. But uh, I think they did a very good job with aging him throughout this, and he did a very solid performance throughout. Now, one of the things I had read about that he that he often got a uh, comment. People commented how how different he looked, how much he'd aged. Uh, when people saw him in real life is compared to when they saw him in Citizen Kane. And he said that he went through just about as much makeup to make him look young in that film, much better than he actually looked in real life. Then almost as, he spent as much time in the makeup chair as compared to when they were making him look old, that he didn't really look that youthful or that good in life that they, uh, they just <laughs> basically that they, they pulled one over on everyone. It's funny how, I thought they aged him pretty well, and they aged other people really poorly. Oh yeah, um, Susan, okay. she she looked like they just they like stuck her face into a jar of makeup and put a wig on her. 
That was at the beginning, right? When she was young. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what about Joseph Cot- Cotton, who played Jebediah Leland, uh, a frequent collaborator with Orson Welles, and in fact is, is, is in most of his big projects? Uh, Lori. Yeah, he was he was he was really really good. There is no one in this that that I didn't think. Um and this was a group of actors that had worked together on the stage and and you can just see their chemistry and how well they all worked together, but I did not like Joseph Cotton's makeup as he aged. Too fake for you? Yeah, definitely. It took away from it. Chris yeah, I agree. His makeup looked uh, terrible for his older uh, portray- portrayal. Um, I think he was my least favorite character of the characters in um, in this film. So I don't I don't have as glowing of a, a review for Joseph Cotton himself. But I think it was more because I just didn't care for his character as much as the others. But um, he he did a, a very good job. Overall, I guess. Why didn't you like his character? I don't know what it was that rubbed me wrong, but uh, you know, I, I just thought he was, um, I thought he was more unlikable than Foster Kane or Charles Kane um, was, and uh, I, I thought he was actually more untrustworthy than than Kane. Why do you say he was untrustworthy? I don't know what it was about his. Uh, there was just I don't know I I think he was very two-faced to me and I don't know what it was specifically I can't pinpoint one part of it but when he was telling his story I mean the the stories clearly were supposed to be of people past their prime um, kind of looking back through I wouldn't exactly say rose-colored glasses but they were definitely telling their stories through different perspective. And I think that he had a very jaded perspective on Kane. I mean, for obvious reasons, he got fired for writing an honest review, but I, there, I just didn't find his story credible out of all of them doing their flashbacks. Matt, you want to go and then I'll retort to Chris. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I'm not sure I, I see what Chris is seeing in that character. I thought um, he was kind of the, uh, the the most trustworthy of the narrators. He was the only one that um, seemed like he saw Kane for what he – saw him all the time and, and never really bought bought the hype. I uh, As far as the acting goes, I don't know why he played the, the older Jedediah the way he did. I don't know if if that was it was written that way, or if that's the way they pulled it. He seemed so happy as an old guy, you know. He seemed like he had moved on completely, and um, and maybe that's what sets him apart from 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 the others. Well, I guess um, Bernstein was, was happy, but I think it's because he never expected anything besides a business relationship from Kane. But as far as the people who are close to him that way, he seemed. He seemed like like Kane couldn't really bring him down in the end, which didn't seem much like his younger character at all to me. So I thought that was a strange choice or just something that was incongruent. I don't know. You, you know, and I'm going to agree with you. I don't see him as the least trustworthy. I see him as the most honest to, and, and most uh, character with the most integrity that he remembers what they started that newspaper for and what Kane had said that his promise would be to his readers and watched it evolve into uh, essentially a, a PR machine for what whatever Kane whatever Kane wanted to back, and it was distasteful for him that he was working for that, and that's why he has to go to the Chicago office. And he didn't write the bad review; he started to, but Kane finished it because Kane knew where he was going, and his integrity wouldn't allow uh, he wouldn't allow uh, well Kane's integrity wouldn't allow him to have not written that review because he knew he knows what that character is. And I think that's one of the Kane fired him, but I think that it's his understanding of that character that he, he wouldn't write a review or force a review on that guy uh, on one of his best friends. And, but that character stayed to me stayed consistent throughout. And 
it was working for Cain and the basically being the distaste the distasteful nature of what he had to do is why he was kind of the, the drunk and so morose. And once he was fired and once he was let go, he was relieved of all that. And that's what, that's how I interpret his, his almost happiness of being away from it and not a part of it anymore, that he didn't have to live with that somewhat double life. See, I didn't see him as being sincere in that. I just thought that he wanted to show up Kane and that's why he sent it back. Like, See, you might have fired me, but you're not sticking to your principles. I I didn't really see any sincerity in that character in that regard. No, I just saw it as him trying to remind him of what his principles, his last gasp, but showing him this is what you need to do. So, but hey, tomato, tomato. Yeah. Uh, the other character I brought up, uh, and it was just more of a, a novelty, is Agnes Moorhead, who played Mary Kane, Kane's mother. And she's not in it a lot, but that I immediately recognized her as Endora from Bewitched in the, I, I think it was all in the 60s, maybe it was the late 50s and 60s. Um, she played like the mother-in-law to Darren and so is, I don't, was it Darwood? Sa- it was it, uh, was it Samantha's mother or was it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it was more the late 60s, was early it the, 70s, wasn't it? Really? It was color. There was some I, black and white. I remember that. There were some black and white episodes. but that Yeah, it was mid to late 60s. I don't even know if they made it to 70s. Oh, okay. But uh, just looking at her videography, she was nominated for four Academy Awards. And, you know, she didn't do much in this role, but this is kind of her f- film debut as well. It's like almost everyone's film debut. But uh, it, I just thought it was interesting that she's, in, I mean, <laughs> she's in Citizen Kane, nominated, later nominated for four Academy Awards, and then she's in Dora on Bewitched. So it's, I mean. Ruth Warwick was on All My Children forever. She played a. Uh, oh, I remember her on that show. Did you, Phoebe, Phoebe no, did you watch no. that really? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, and she is who? I can't remember. I just remember that she was one of the Mercury players and she was in that. She's one of the smaller parts, but I can't. I oh. meant to look it up and I can't remember. By the way, Bewitched was 1964 to 72. Oh, wow. That, God, that went on for that long. So, yeah. Uh, I liked that show. Uh, Two you different know, Darwoods. And <laughs> you and Chris and I probably remember it. Matt, do you even know what show we're talking about? Yeah, no, I watched it a bit as a kid. I caught some some reruns. Oh, okay. So wasn't completely over your head. Um, okay, one interesting thing about this, the William Randolph Hearst controversy. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, uh, a multimillionaire millionaire, uh, publisher at the time uh, of many newspapers across the nation, this film is supposed to be loosely based off some of the things in his life, loosely based off three, I think three different people's lives. And then a little bit of Orson Welles's life as well. And, but Hearst is supposed to be the driving force behind it, who he tried to kill this project at, during its production multiple times, refused to allow any promotion of it in his newspapers and possibly it caused it to be the box office failure that it was in its time, as well as it not to be appreciated by Hollywood in its time. Um, are you, did you, in your research, did you guys come across that or find anything about that? Interesting. Interesting. I had never heard that it was also based on Orson Welles. Uh, supposedly a small part of it is supposed to be autobiographical, but I don't know what part. That's interesting. Maybe the sled. I don't know. It's, yeah, that that is fascinating. And there are many parallels. I mean, even to his name and um it wasn't Hearst married to an a, a kind of a B movie actress that he tried to promote. Yes. And I mean there you can't deny the um It may have killed a guy. He did kill a guy reportedly. He killed a, he tried to kill Charlie Chaplin and shot someone else instead and then had it covered up. I didn't know and, that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Hearst Castle, the similarities to Xanadu. And I, it's, it's definitely intriguing. And, and I don't think it's, it's uh, well disguised. No, it's, it's, it's pretty blatant. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not subtle. Well, I actually thought that in many ways the, the drama behind the scenes with Hearst was 
as interesting and in some regards even more interesting than this movie to me. Um, there was a lot of drama with it. Um, even little shots that may or may not have occurred. Um, I read somewhere that Rosebud might have been a euphemism for a certain lady part <laughs> that uh, Hearst uh, uh, called uh, – uh, described on his lady friend. Um, so I, I don't really know. I'll, I'll keep it PG for Lori, but um, uh, I just, the whole drama with Hearst is very, very interesting to me. Yeah, I know. I, I did. I, I, uh, and I don't know if you mentioned this, Patrick, I remember reading that um, Hearst refused or forbid this movie from being mentioned in his, in his publications. So I think he felt it. Oh yeah. And I, I'm not saying, I agree with Chris that it's the drama behind the scenes is, is, is equal to the drama on the screen. But I think it's very interesting that especially a film that as well regarded as, and we'll get into it later, the legacy of this film as well regarded. This film is that, that Hearst was fairly effective in killing it in its time so that it was not a box office hit so that it didn't win the Academy Awards uh, that it probably deserved and actually got booed at the Academy Awards, which is shocking in this day and age because the the nature that they have of not you know booing you know uh, other people's artwork, uh, especially when it's just merely nominated. But anytime it was mentioned, they would boo it. Um, well, I think that Hearst would have labeled them as a communist, and then their careers would have been over right then and there if they didn't uh, go with his with his line of thought. So I, I think that they it was. Not that uh, I think that Hollywood was just afraid for their own survival personally. Yeah, but it's, the film is the character is not called Hearst. It's called Citizen Kane. So, well, it, unfortunately, he crossed Hearst. And so if Hearst is against this film, you you don't have a choice with the amount of power that he had in the newspaper. I mean, Hollywood is all about publicity, getting your name out there. And if uh, he controls most of the newspapers in the country and he's refusing to run your name if uh if you support one movie i mean what what would you choose would you rather not have any sort of work or livelihood or would you just ignore this film for this guy i, I think a lot of them did choose to uh to blacklist citizen kane and orson wells just so they didn't get blacklisted themselves i uh you got to kind of like the irony in Hearst's reaction. You know, call me a tyrant, I'll bury you and eat your bones. <laughs> you know, like, he only kind of proved him right. And they're not they're not a lot less sympathetic characters than Hearst out there. I mean, the guy was essentially the uh, biggest pusher of clickbait in his day um who um tried to make money by starting wars. You know, I mean that's that's a lot of it. Yeah, but doesn't he draw attention to the film and what the film may be about by making a big deal? It's a, kind of one of those things. Is, there's no such thing as bad publicity because by making an issue of it, by trying to kill it and, and it being well known in the time and him making comments that it will not be advertised in his, in his newspapers is the other newspapers picking up the story and running with that. And, did they? Uh, yeah, they did run with it. That they, they, that it wasn't anything being to embarrass Hearst, right? And it, it's time, and you make the, you're make, creating the story that you don't want it to be. It would have just been a movie coming out, but for you trying to kill the project. Yeah, I'm not sure how how it backfired or not. I mean, it wasn't financially successful. You would hope it did, uh, but maybe he really did control enough media that suppressing it in his his own outlets was sufficient to to really kind of deal a good blow to it. I, I don't know. Yeah, but ultimately I think Orson Welles is redeemed. I mean, and lived to see it too. This is not a film that suddenly in 1990 all of a, all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, Citizen Kane is great. I mean, this it, it gets its resurgence about 14, 15 years later and people start to appreciate it. And then in the 1960s is generally considered the greatest American film ever made. Well, he's, well and he's still getting the last laugh right right now. Yeah, as we're talking about it. Yeah, I mean, Hearst is his name is forever entwined with this film, whether he liked it or not. But you know, p people didn't really start seeing this film again until after Hearst died, because I think Hearst died in about fifty one or so. And uh, this film was shelved for about what did we say about ten, fifteen years after it debuted. Yeah, about that. 
So Hearst had to die for this movie to start coming out and people to revisiting it. Well, in archaeo, uh, in the event of in invention of television and the proliferation of television and RKO Studios being one of the first studios to sell off their films to be broadcast on television is what helps create the resurgence of this. So there's 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 multiple things, but Hearst being uh, Hearst death probably being a major contribution to that. Uh, the other uh, this film, the other thing about this film is the impact this film had on filmmaking in general. That this is often uh, noted for its nonlinear storytelling, um, the cinematography of it, uh, the uh, the uh, somewhat of the makeup, of which we've already kind of you know pounced all over a little bit, but specifically cinematography and the storytelling method that he used in this was just not used that much back, back in the, the 1940s. And it's a film I hadn't seen in about 10 or 15 years. And specifically the cinematography, I was really blown away about the camera angles that Orson Welles, or at least a cinematographer used in this particular film, because they're very unorthodox, but it makes the film look so much more interesting because it's just, it's not, wow, that's, this is just this, this is a two person shot, you know, with, with the, the desk in the background, he, you know, he, he chooses a lot of low angles for certain scenes, he high angles for other scenes, um, you know, shooting things from a distance um, to give that, you know, just the emptiness of, of, of Orson or not Orson Welles is probably his life too, but Charles Foster Kane's life to see the big empty rooms that he's in all by himself or just him and his wife. I thought it was just a really amazing. Did you guys note it or did you find it interesting at all? Oh, I noted it. Okay. And you, the thing is too, it, I was really taken by it and it never felt like he was trying too hard. It really, it just really felt like he was in control. And my favorite shot, and it's it's one you know I think it's pretty iconic though, is that um, political rally he's holding, um, where he's in that big that big dark room. You can barely tell that anyone else is even in it, and he's got that giant um, mug shot behind him with Kane on it, which I thought was just not only was it was it beautiful and striking, it was so perfect for that guy's campaign. It was such a great a great rhetoric and such a great shot. I, I, I loved it. I, I liked all the the things that Matt has talked about and you've talked about, about it uh, with the angles and such. One of the more striking for me was when he lost his campaign and uh, you know, basically he hit a new low and he was in, in his campaign uh, room by himself. And who was with them at the time? Was that, was Leland in the room with them and, and they were talking I believe, yeah. um, but the camera angle, it was basically the camera was set on the ground. Uh, so he was at his, his personal bottom and it, and you viewed it from the ground up. So I, that was a very interesting moment visually. And I liked that a lot, but another thing, uh, and I don't, I don't think it had been done before. This was, was the beginning and ending where the beginning only had a, a title. And I think the ending, it was just, it showed like a little clip of each of the people uh, from the movie. I don't remember ever seeing an ending like that where um, it, it was like a little clip. The, no, the ending, or excuse me, the beginning credits was very unusual for its time. Something it's a standard commonplace today, but uh, just, just simply a title without any kind of other, um, credits for the actors, writers, producers, et cetera, et cetera. When I watch it, I real I don't realize how innovative it was because, as you said, so much of it has become commonplace today that they still use a lot of the the um, framing and 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 shots that he used. But at that time, it was completely new. You know, and this is coming from a guy who did plays. I mean, that's what Orson Welles was known for. Was he was he was involved in theater, not, you know, not filmmaking. And to, to, I mean, to handle, at least have the vision to create the, this with uh, this type of film is just, it, it's amazing what he did with it. And I mean, and he does things like that through the remainder of his films that he directs. I mean, Touch of Evil has got one of the best, um, you know, long, continuous long shots ever in cinema. I mean, it, it's absolutely great. If makes possibly the the entire film just because of the, the, what he does in that and it's he 
he's possibly one of the most underappreciated directors, I think, uh, in his his life, even though he'll possibly have directed one of the best films of all time. um, I don't think he got the credit for what he did. I would agree. Uh, What about symbolism and hidden meanings, Chris? Oh, there's none in this film. Okay. All right. Moving on. (laughs) Next. No, um, I think the, the biggest symbolism is pretty much what this film is about would be rosebud i mean what is rosebud symbolize what is rosebud to you what is it to to kane and to me i think it, it represents more than just um his last words I, I think it rosebud is really a symbolic of his entire life as we find out at the end it's his his childhood sled but i think it's more than that i think it's his his childhood that he's been holding on to his whole life that he hasn't gotten over, uh, that he longs for. Um, it's Rosebud is an attachment to the life he had when he had maybe his happiest time in his life when he was a little kid with two parents, even though I think his dad was an abusive alcoholic. But I think that's the biggest symbolism in this film is is Rosebud and his sled. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from, Chris. But um, the funniest thing is I watched this as a ki- as a child. And I would have until I watched it again recently, I would have sworn to you that Rosebud was a snow globe. Well, because that's, that's what I think that's what they well, think that's it is. One of my other symbol symbols that I was going to talk about. But go ahead, Patrick. No, that well, that's. That's what the, like the the I don't know the butler or something says to him is that it's the so- snow globe because he picks it up when he's smashing everything in his his wife's room and doesn't smash that and says rosebud and so that the interpretation is that it has something to do with rosebud but it's not actually rosebud it's just a snow globe with a sunny hill let, potentially reminding him of his sleigh. Mm. And it also represents a smaller contained world that he left. You know, the, the the scene with this family, it was a snowy, small little world in Colorado. He didn't know anything of this greater world. And if I remember correctly, he first saw this snow globe with his second wife, Susan. And I think it was originally her snow globe, wasn't it? Yes. And so I, I think there's some sort of correlation between what he saw in Susan and uh, that longing that he was looking for in his childhood and they're all interconnected, uh, the snow globe, the the sled, Susan. I, I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to watch this a few more times to see what I think he sees in Susan. But there is um, there is definitely some, they're all related. You now, it's interesting that you say that it reminds, the, the sled is a symbol of uh, happiness in his life. And I know that one of the universal interpretations is that Rosebud means something to him because that was the la- that was his true happiness in his life. And I kind of wonder about that watching it this time knowing what Rosebud is is that he does not strike me as an unhappy man through most of the film up until he begins to have the affair and he loses the election and everything like that. Then he becomes a miserable son of a bitch, but before that he seems pretty happy in his life. So I, you know, I don't necessarily buy off on the interpretation uh, that that was the happiest time in his life, but I do believe it is a simpler time in his life, that it was, it was a lot less of the responsibilities and a lot less of the stress that his life has brought him. Most of it self-created, um, but I don't, I, I, I just, I just, I, he does not strike me as a character throughout the entire film as miserable. Is that or unhappy? I think he, he seems very happy through most of the film, up until everything starts to go bad. Well, I think he was searching though the whole film for something that he couldn't film. But I do agree that he didn't really become kind of miserable on screen until his later life, and pretty much when the older guys that they I would say all the older guys that they show towards the end are all kind of grumpy in that same manner. So maybe it's a commentary on life that as you get old, you just get jaded and long for your younger years. Yeah, that's because these kids don't know what they're doing these days, Chris. That's what I'm telling you. So No, they'd be like, why is it in black and white? Can't you colorize <laughs> that stuff? Any other symbolism, Chris? Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about, uh, which 
was his damn collection of statues. Uh, that was front and center in a lot of this. You know, they commented all the time. And that's got to represent something in his life. I didn't know if it's um, it's a representation of human figures that he can control and position as he wants that uh, aren't going to surprise him and give him, I wouldn't say lip, but, uh, you know, that they represent controlling people, whereas real-life people he's he's kind of disappointed with or isn't finding what he wants with them, but he's got these perfect statues that represent everything. Well, I don't know what they represent to him, but they represent something important to him, and that's why he collects them one after another. Company. And that's another blatant Hearst. Um, Reference? D- did yeah. Hearst collect statues? Statues, artwork. Yeah, Hearst, Hearst Castle is amazing. Well, but I, I often wonder because, you know, he, he starts by filling his office at the newspaper with all these statues and stuff. And then ultimately his uh, Xanadu uh, is, is, is covered with them. But it's not so much that he can manipulate them. I saw it as that it, it's company. It's the, it's the presence of mm-hmm. a person without the person being there. And it, the older he got and the more the recluse he got, the more of them he had. And it was more company form until at the end when you see, you know, hundreds of them all over the place, all over the, the cat or the, his, his home, um, that he is just stored there. Um, that, that's how I interpret it. Well, even With- Susan was kind of relegated to a statue at a certain point, uh, in doing, uh, puzzles. You know, she, she didn't really move a whole lot. She was visually, she, all she did was move little pieces and complain and complain and complain. <laughs> All right, Matt, we've we've left you alone during Chris's symbolism. What do you have to bring to it? What do you have to comment on that? And I'm sure it leads into your moral universe. Yeah, no, I I, I think this movie wears wears its message on its sleeve. You you have Jedediah kind of spell a lot of it out and Susan kind of finishes the job, but I think um I was trying to think of the reason that the, the movie sets us up for why he's so unhappy. And I, I think he's unhappy, and I think he, he wants to um, – the reason why he's so dissatisfied with everything, the way everything worked out for him is because he um, failed at his attempt to make everyone love him on his terms. And that um, you, you can't, you can't um, buy not, – it's not that you can't buy people's love. It's that – Exchanges of material things are um, insufficient to replace giving some of yourself to other people. Um, and one one um, exchange that struck me uh, this time, I had never really noticed it before when I watched the movie, is when he loses the election and Jedediah is talking to him. And this is, this is of course, after he accuses the incumbent governor of trying to steal the, the love of the working class away from him. And... Um, Jedediah gives him that kind of rant where he says, hey, that working class, by the way, they're turning into organized labor um, and kind of they're going to be able to take care of themselves and other, you know, they don't need you. In fact, they might come for a piece of what you got. And this this kind of seems heartbreaking to to Kane. The, not I think that I don't think his character would have necessarily been opposed to unionization but the fact that they could start to stand up for themselves without him, that they didn't need him anymore. Um, and then with Susan, he keeps giving her these things um, in lieu of giving her any kind of intimacy or any any portion of himself. So I, I think the movie has a very um, – very uplifting core to it, although it gives us kind of the negative aspect of um, whether or not you're actually willing to be with people or whether or not, again, you want to collect statues because they're like people um, and you can control and position them, but ultimately you don't have to give anything to them besides money. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I think he was legitimately hurt by the, by that scene that Matt was talking about where he realized that you know, he kind of wanted to be the man who brought 
who who brought I, I guess uh, prosperity to the masses. And when he learned that uh, he didn't, they didn't need him. I, I do think that part of his purpose in life was was taken away from him. I think it's another example, though, of you know, money doesn't buy happiness. It makes you having too much money just makes one miserable. It appears. Oh God, I wish I had that kind of misery. Um, I know those those problems <laughs> so I could handle. I know <laughs> it's a challenge I would like to tackle. Like you know, one percent, the one percent level of first world problems, but no, you know, even more so than that is it not necessarily can buy you happiness, but it does put kind of a, uh, a filter on your, your ability to perceive what happiness is or to perceive what it is to be around other people who don't live in your sphere of influence and don't have that kind of, you know, the, the opportunities that present itself and that you, you tend to, and you see it in a lot of people who become ultra wealthy is that you tend to isolate yourselves and poss- possibly a lot of it for, you know, almost self-defense reasons is that there's so many people out there who are leeches and they jump on you and, and they just want money and they, they don't really care about you. And it's hard. It, it be, it be, you, you begin to isolate yourself and you be, begin to eliminate, eliminate those people from your life because they, 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 they can't, they're just going to, they're not really there for you. They're there for what they can get from you. And not that I think that was the basis of what Charles Foster Kane was. I think he isolated himself because he, he felt so betrayed by the world and, and he just got one, just one blow after another. And he was so desperate to prove himself right that even when he knew he wasn't, he would still try to press forward to make make what what he wanted to happen happen by sheer will and and as that betrayal by the people i think that you know ultimately that contributes to his isolation is that he's constantly betrayed in not just the election but the how they don't accept his his wife that he so desperately wants her to be a talented singer that he throws all this money into doing something but is never going to get that acceptance and partially because because he's the one behind it well i, I thought it was interesting for a story about a guy this about the relationships of a guy this wealthy is that it really wasn't a movie about everyone trying to get a piece of this guy. It was almost exactly the opposite. It was a movie about people who wanted um, friends with integrity and intimacy and instead got someone who threw money at them. Um, I, I thought that, you know, people kept running away from his money. Yeah. I was just using an analogy of what other people do. <laughs> oh no, no, I, 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 I didn't think you were suggesting that, but I, I did. Um, it, it's kind of, re- it's kind of remarkable, you know. It's kind of the opposite of a, of it feels like most stories we we view about wealthy people with bad relationships. Well, and, and but if you look at it, he does have his, his his loyal followers. Bernstein, for instance, is. I mean, he just. He's, he's another one you couldn't trust. Yeah, he he will say what he needs to do to keep his job and keep himself in the good graces of Charles Foster Kane. When they're looking at uh, Leland's uh, review of the 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 play or the opera, it, it is a little bit, it can be interpreted either way. And of course, he takes the more positive interpretation in front of Kane, but Kane knows what Leland was intending to do there. But he he's an example of one of the hangers on that, you know... I, I do believe he was friends with Kane or at least the, you know, fictional, you know, Kane, but I don't necessarily believe that he, he would, he stands by him, but th- through thick and thin. No. And, and I think the one, the one reason he's the only one who really looks back positively on him is because he's the only one who got what he wanted, which was just, it was just business. It was a job. To yeah. Him, I think. Yeah. He was heavily rewarded for his loyalty over the years. Anything else? Not for me. All right. On to the end of the film. Uh, one of the most, you know, most memorable sequences in the film. The, the, the basically is the beginning and then this film is what is Rosebud? And we're ultimately given the reveal at the end of the film of what Rosebud is. Now, when I saw this, I did not know anything. I, 
I didn't know what Rosebud was. I, I had not read anything about the film, and I didn't see this until I was probably in my 20s. Um, but I had not did not know the mythology of what Rosebud was or even that it was even mentioned at the beginning. So I was very entran- entrenched into finding out what this the meaning of this word is and who is this person or what does what symbol is this mean to this now deceased character and the first time i saw it i got to say that i was a little bit disappointed that it was the freaking sled uh that it, or sled it didn't mean that much to me it wasn't until i seen it repeat viewings of the film that it had taken on a much greater symbolism to me my question to you is what do you think of the ending and was the first time you saw the film did what was your reactions to what rosebud means lori um the the first time i saw it i was a kid and i didn't really understand you know i was pretty young so i didn't really understand what was what was going on but i think as i watched it growing up i i was i was kind of confused by what is this you know what does this mean but as is Every, you know that's the whole mystery of the film um i i still think i i i think that was probably intentional to leave it ambiguous and and probably genius because it can you know we can all put our interpretation and put our baggage in it and what we think rosebud represents Ooh, the I word. I know Chris likes interpretation. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I do like that. Um, like you, I was I was an adult when I first saw this as well. I didn't see it growing up, but um, I I still remember my my initial reaction, and I still kind of have it now. And I don't know if it's just because I'm I'm jaded or I've always been jaded or what. But the the guy throwing the the sled into the furnace. My thought is, if you've had this reporter and probably other reporters going around, what is Rosebud? And you see this sled and um, get some money for it. You know, <laughs> you you have no loyalty to Kane. Go find that reporter who just w- said he would pay a thousand dollars for the story. Make some money off of it. I I think that's what people would do nowadays. Hey, you want you want a story? Here's the sled. Here's a, I'll give you a picture with it on there. Um, eBay. I, eBay, yeah. I really think that you would not have, if you knew that people were interested in what Rosebud was and you see a sled with the words Rosebud on it, you, you don't destroy it. Or maybe these guys just could care less. I don't know. But my that's always been my reaction. It's still my reaction is you got to pay the bills, make some money. Matt, I really, I really like the way it ended. Um, I like the uh, that it, it leaves the the viewer to to think about it a lot, and I think it uh, it couldn't have ended any better. <laughs> Succinctly put. All right, film's legacy. This is going to take a little while. <laughs> Nominated for nine Academy Awards, winning only one, although it was considered a favorite going into the Academy Awards. One best writing original screenplay, which uh, Orson Welles did get. He shared a, a credit with another writer, uh, Mankiewicz, I think it was. Uh, lost best picture to How Green Was My Valley. Uh, lost best actor to Gary Cooper for Sergeant York. So I know uh, Matt is how he feels about Gary Cooper. He's probably excited about that. Best, oh my gosh. Be, best director to John Ford for How Green Was My Valley. Best cinematography, uh, black and white film, to, lost to How Green Was My Valley. So I guess it wasn't very green if it was in black and white. Uh, best art direction, interior decoration, black and white to How Green Was My Valley. Best sound recording to That Hamilton Woman, which I'd never heard of. Uh, best music. School- Vivian Lee was in that. Who? Vivian Lee. I don't know that one. Uh, Best Music, Score for Dramatic Picture, Lost to the Devil and Daniel Webster, and Best Film Editing, Lost to Sergeant York as well. AFI, in 1998, ranked the film the number one greatest film of all time. When they came back and did it again in 2007, it was ranked the number one greatest film of all time. Did not move. The movie's line, Rosebud, was voted as the number 17th greatest movie quote by, uh, by AFI. 
The film's score was one of uh, the 250 nominated scores uh, for the top 25 film scores in Amer American cinema uh, in a 2005 poll. IMDb has the film at number 67 on their top 250 films. Roger Ebert called Citizen Kane the greatest film ever made, but people don't always ask him about the greatest film. They ask, what's your favorite movie? And his response is always the same, Citizen Kane. The film was also ranked number one on the following best films, uh, following lists of best of lists. Julio Castedo's The number, the 100 Best Films of the Century, Time Out Magazine's Top 100 Films of the Century, The Village Voice, 100 Greatest Films, the Royal Belgian Film Archive's Most Important and Misappreciated American Films. This was the one I thought was most interesting. Sight and Sound voted uh, as great as the greatest film ever made in its 1962 poll. Number one, retained the top spot in that poll until 2012. 50 years it stayed in the top spot on that until Vertigo replaced it in 2012. That new up and coming film, <laughs> yeah, apparently. from Alfred Hitchcock. Good possibility it may get it may take number one back at some point. Voted number six in total films, hundred greatest films of all time in November of two thousand and five. Was voted the second greatest film of all time by Entertainment Weekly. The movie's line Rosebud was voted as the number three of the hundred greatest movie lines by Premier Magazine in two thousand and seven. Here's another one. The movie's line, old age, it's the only de disease, Mr. Thompson, that they that you don't look forward to being cured of, was voted number 90 on the 100 greatest movie lines by Premiere Magazine in 2007, which I didn't even remember that line in the film. 1989, it was taken into the National Film Registry and the U.S. United States Library of Congress. It was one of the first 25 films inducted into that registry. Rotten Tomatoes has it a 100% critics 91 percent audience and despite all this legacy and there is many many more this was just a cross section of some of the more interesting ones i thought uh despite all its, uh its legacy and all the publicity when this film came out it was a box office flop and was considered it was quickly consigned to the rko vaults in 1941's academy awards as we've already mentioned was booed every time one of its nine nomina nine nominations was announced and it was only Has that ever happened. Uh, not Besides. that I, I've never heard of it happening. Um, granted, I was not alive in 1941, so or 42. You mean people were paid to do that? Uh, possibly. So I, I think they were afraid again. for their livelihood. I really think that they were afraid of being blacklisted at this time, and so they just mm. did what they thought should be done. What they thought they reacted how they thought they were supposed to react. Right. And I think it only happened. The only other time it happened was in uh, when Mariah Carey's movies were uh, nominated for Best Picture. <laughs> uh, that hasn't happened. Sachin uh, Littlefeather was booed. Well, she yeah, but she was booed for what she was saying, not yeah. for the film right. itself. So, uh, the film only regained popularity in the, the mid nineteen fifties when RKO RKO had released its um, sold its film rights to uh, some television studios, and the. French uh, cinema buffs began to uh, talk about this film as the uh, how it was underappreciated as well as the influence that it had on filmmaking at the time. And so a lot of people began to go back and look at it. And that's why by 1962, uh, Sight and Sound, a, the UK poll, puts it as number one and stays there for 50 years. So that being said, uh, what do you think of the legacy? And do you put this film in your top 100? Lori. I definitely think the um, later legacy is deserved and it's, it's shocking um, that it was booed at the Academy Awards and, and that it, it lost. Um, um, and yes, it is in my top 100. Chris. Do we know if Orson Welles was surprised that it got booed or didn't win any, um, awards? Was he expecting anything from it? What I'd read is it was it was considered the front runner for an award, so he was probably surprised both at the reaction as well as not winning more awards. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is in my top one hundred. It's a great film. I don't even know how I would come up with criteria to say that it's the greatest film ever made. I, I would have to think about that. I mean, it's very well made. It stands up. 
uh, awesomely. I mean, it, it, it looks great at the angles, the, the way it was constructed, um, and, and the pacing, everything. So there's very little bad I can say about this film. I, I don't know if I would put it as the greatest movie ever made, though. But, um, yeah, it's definitely up there. Uh, I, with Chris, would not put this as the greatest film ever made. It is a great film, easily in my top 100. Um, but it's a film that I do think, I, I do love it for its cinematography, but I, and I do like it for its non-linear linear storytelling. But at the end of the day, I don't think that the film itself is the story is really all that unique. And this would be another example of I've seen films similar to it of someone who has success or wealth and then becomes isolated and becomes kind of a recluse for various different reasons, told so many times that this wasn't that unique in its time. But it is a great film. And I think it's I have a deeper appreciation for it because I did not know anything about the William Randall Hearst controversy and what this film went through to get made, to get released, and then that it was just basically you know, not, don't want to say disown, but, you know, relegated to the, the dustbins and then basically saved 15 years later and appreciated it for what it was. So it is in my top 100. I think it's well deserving of the legacy. It definitely deserves more Academy Awards. I've seen How Green is my Val- Was My Valley, and I do not consider that a very great film by any stretch of the imagination. This would be one of those examples where the Academy got it completely wrong that year. But Matt, uh, your your nominee, so you get the last word. Yeah, I think the legacy is appropriate, and I've I've said before I don't think there's such a thing as the greatest movie ever made, or or anything like that. I don't have a favorite movie, but this is one of those movies that would would be on the list I would make of greatest movies ever made, and so um, it's in my top 100. It's it's probably in my top five. I I really really like this movie. Um, I've, I've liked it at least as much every time I've seen it. So this is one of my, one of my very favorite movies. It's one of the movies I respect the absolute most. And I liked it watching it again this time as much as I've watched it the several times previously. Do you think this is partially one of the reasons why you like there will be blood so much? Cause there's a lot of similarities in the two and the characters, not completely, but I, I do after watching that film and then this one, I did see both in a little bit different light. Yeah, I, I like the part where Kane took the the bowling pin and beat his second wife to death with it. That was a, that was a really unexpected. It came out of nowhere, especially in 1941. So I could see it that happening. Me of, there will be blood. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, I interrupted you. No, no, that's, I, 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 it wouldn't surprise me too much if he did it. <laughs> that's true. Well, he, if that, if globe. Susan was in her um, was in her bedroom when he was uh, trashing her bedroom, he might have uh, he might have hit her with something. Okay. <laughs> the end. Yeah, that's all I got all right. on that. All right, and with that pleasant thought, all right, that does it for this week's review of Citizen Kane. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little biweekly podcast. If you had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news and upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on our upcoming podcasts on the MHM Podcast Network, including Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, Mail Bonding, and the Number Two Review. And There's it, a network now? We did this last time. You don't remember this? <laughs> it's a network. <laughs> Nothing. We got the proper funding. Yeah, we did. The money came through. Somebody bought a book that off Amazon. That is until <laughs> William Randolph first banned <laughs> us from posting anything. Uh, additionally, you can follow us on uh, on all of our side projects. Chris hosts the Number Two Review podcast, which can be also heard on MHM. Lori will be appearing at the upcoming podcast Sunday Seconds with the Duke, our John Wayne retrospective podcast that will begin appearing on MHM later this year once we get off our asses and actually start recording it. Um, Matt <laughs> appears regularly on Mail Bonding, the James Bond podcast here on MHM, and you can follow him on Twitter at Haybucker. 
Finally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that is it for this episode of Movie House Memories and our review of Citizen Kane. Join us next time when we review Chris's next pick, Empire Records. A little known... From Citizen Kane to Empire (laughs) Records. Quite, quite a jump. Although Empire Records is a very hidden gem from the 1990s. I will give you that, Chris. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm William Randolph. Chris. I'm Lori. And I'm currently accepting applications for servers at Xanadu. (laughs) And we will see you all next time at our house. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incomputech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>